What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Bam! Yes, Rob Core Rings. If you guys are interested in having one, um, check out the link in the description. Uh, it'll go to patreon.com slash comics explained. I have a system there, a reward system, and it is the only real way I could figure out to give the things away equitably. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, feel free to check that out. So, X-Force Explained. All right, I was going through my list of teams and things we've talked about. We've talked about New Mutants, we've explained New Warriors, we've talked about X-Men on a couple, different, uh, a couple different occasions. We've explained the Avengers, I'm pretty sure, Justice League, all that stuff. We've never explained X-Force. And, well, really, now's the only time to ever do it. There'll never be a better time to explain X-Force <laughs> than with the release of Deadpool 2. X-Force is a really intriguing team. X-Force is a really interesting situation. So, uh, a lot of people would say that X-Force made their debut back in 19. 1991 with X-Force Volume 1, Issue Number 1, but that's actually not true. Uh, in reality, X-Force goes all the way back to New Mutants, and the reason why is because uh, the New Mutants line of stories are basically designed to kind of give us this reworking of the X-Men, kind of like a new generation of X-Men, since the original team was believed to have been killed, or at least the uncanny X-Men were believed to have been killed, and it was just a way to spin out a new X-Men title because the team was so popular. Uh, originally, it was written by Chris Claremont, then it was taken over by Louise Simonson, and then towards the end of her writing, Rob Liefeld came on. Now, with regards to Rob Liefeld's run, and this is really where the X-Force concept starts to take off, you essentially kind of pick up with like issue number 86 or so. And the reason why was because that's when Liefeld really came on and actually became writer for the X-Force line of stories. Uh, and, and the way this worked was that in the mind of Liefeld, you know, looking at the interviews and so on, in the mind of Liefeld, the biggest struggle that the New Mutants had is that they were reminiscent of an age of comics that didn't really apply anymore. In the sense that you had the, the New Mutants just kind of being teenagers who were under the watchful eye of Xavier, and there were some great stories early in the beginning, uh, and then you had things like the New Mutants who were taken over, or really the, the X-Men universe more or less, uh, the role of Xavier was replaced with uh, the role of, of Magneto due to the fact that Xavier was removed from the landscape, and while those stories worked, the reality is that towards the end of the New Mutants run with issue number 100, sales were waning, and they were basically dropping off, but they started to experience a kind of resurgence as you got from issue number 86 running up to issue number 100, and the reason for this is when Rob Liefeld took over, his idea was amp the team up, make them a lot more hardcore. And the reason for that was because there was there was ample evidence to indicate that's the direction people wanted stories to go in. And there were a lot of stories to indicate that that was the case. I mean, you had 1971's The Night Gwen Stacy Died, you had uh, Frank Miller's entire Daredevil run, you had Batman uh, The Dark Knight Returns, you had Batman Year One, you had a lot of stories that were coming out around that time that were a lot darker, that were far edgier, that were moving away from kind of like the wholesome, somewhat dark, you know, interim period between Stanley and Jack Kirby's original runs on the various Marvel characters and what basically became the 1990s. And so when 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 Rob Liefeld sat down, he basically started moving the story in a direction that made it darker and made it more hardcore. And this came with the introduction of Cable. Now, originally, Cable was just super obscure. You didn't know anything about him. And in fact, you didn't really learn anything about Cable until... May of 1993, really, when his solo series first picked up, and even then, like it was a little, a little questionable. Um, for but you know, sticking to X Force and kind of not focusing too much on Cable, since we already have a Cable Explained video, is sticking to X Force. The idea was taking this New Mutants group of teams and and basically beefing them up. And so over the course of the first, well, really the final, you know, 14 issues or so, you started getting things like uh, like the the introduction of Domino, the introduction of like copycat characters like that. The idea that like the they, the team was basically being moved away from the whole idea of new, uh, new Mutants functioning under the watchful eye of, uh, of Charles Xavier. And so when X-Force Volume 1, issue number one picked up, when it was first released, uh, it was it was massive. I mean, it was absolutely huge. And there are a couple reasons for why this is the case. The first reason is because it was a wholly new X-Men title. X-Force never existed, right? I mean, X-Force, you know, X-Men Volume 2, issue number one, the, the highest selling comic book of all time, that was the second volume of the original Stan Lee and Jack Kirby run. But that was huge because the Uncanny X-Men had been made a massive publication by the writing of Chris Claremont. You've had like different iterations of the Avengers and you've had different Avengers stories over the years, Avengers Forever and New Avengers and things like that. But X-Force was brand new. There was nothing like it. Now there were a few things that had happened before that in terms of other publications that had been released and we'll talk about that here in a second. But because it was so huge, it immediately drew the eye of 
everyone. It drew the eye of the entire X-Men universe because the reality was that in the late 80s and the early 90s, if a title had X attached to it, it sold. That's just the way it was because X-Men were so popular. So it immediately drew the eyes of the comic book reader and then it drew the eyes of the comic book collector because it was the first issue of a series that had never existed before. And so like it, it just exploded in popularity. Now, for, for Rob Liefeld's worth, he wrote it for about the first nine issues. But really, I would say the brains behind the operation on the original X-Force title was a guy named Fabian Nassiza. Now, Fabian Nassiza was a person who had a long-standing history with Marvel. He'd been writing for quite some time. Back in 1989 with... Thor 412, uh, Editor-in-Chief Tom DeFalco launched the New Warriors, and it was basically just kind of like a spinoff group. It was Young Avengers before Young Avengers, with some New Mutants themes thrown in, in terms of like how they related to each other and so on, uh, but it was relatively popular. Fabian de Caesar wrote it for the first 53 issues, between 1990 running up to 1994, uh, and I mean, he did fine. You know, it, was a, it was a fine job. He did things like writing Avengers Spotlight, let's see, he wrote like uh, classic X-Men, which were basically uh, oh, like the old school, uncanny X-Men stories that were reprinted with a few more good you know goodies and tidbits that were thrown in that weren't originally there to kind of help flesh those stories out a little bit more he had a huge standing history in that and so with regards to his role he was basically a scripter meaning that he was the one behind the scenes saying here's the general outline for the direction the story is going to go and then rob liefeld would just kind of fill it in with writing and, and art and so on and so forth but because rob liefeld left in the first nine issues the entire run of x factor was i'm sorry x force was handed over to fabian nasiza and the reason why this matters is in Marvel Comics and even DC Comics, it was a long-standing rule that when a creator created a character that was part and parcel to that universe, it basically belonged to whoever that publisher was. And there were a few landmark cases that came out of this. For example, you had Steve Gerber who sued Marvel over Howard the Duck. You know, we talked about that in, I think, the Howard the Duck Explained video. Uh, there were different things like that that went into the, to the whole idea of how creators were perceived. Uh, that led to a lot of frustration because you had a lot of characters or a lot of creators who were basically told, hey, look, you can write Captain America, but only in this small sphere. You can't branch out of that sphere. You can't write him in a way that's not been normally depicted. Like a story like Secret Empire never would have happened in the early 90s, even the late 80s. Like you would never see a story like that because adjusting Captain America in that way was a huge no-no. And so what this did is it led to, to writers like writers and, and even artists like Alan Silvestri and Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee and a lot of Marvel's, really their top talent in the early 90s, just jumping ship. They bailed out, they went to Image and the rest is history. And so with, with the whole idea of X-Force falling to Fabian Nassiza in his mind, uh, from what I gather in the interviews, he didn't want to be seen as a poor man's Rob Liefeld. And Rob Liefeld's writing style and art had made X-Force huge because you were talking about people being drawn in such a way that they were massive in size. Not only that, the, the, the big differentiation between X-Force and New Mutants is that New Mutants were just kind of like the new X-Men in training. X-Force was immediately taken over, really like when Cable showed up, he immediately took over the team and said, you guys are basically going to be like a, a strike team. That's really what you guys are going to be. You're going to be my personal strike team. And uh, and they, they served that role well in the sense that they, they fought things like the Mutant Liberation Front that was led by Strife. They were they fought, what was it, the right, I think it was. They fought like a lot of these really, really hardcore militant groups because the focus of X-Force and, and the latter stages of the New Mutants was we're fighting for mutant rights and we'll do whatever we have to do to win. And it was, it was pretty sadistic. You take that and you bring in elements like you saw in New Mutants number 98 with the introduction of Copycat, basically a character like Mystique whose powers are far more advanced. You can even copy the powers of others, the introduction of Deadpool. You talk about like all these things that kind of fold into the beginning of New Mutants, uh, I'm sorry, the beginning of X-Force with Rob Liefeld, and it was a recipe for success. But when Rob Liefeld left, all eyes turned to Nasiza. And when Nasiza took over, his immediate response was shift everything up. And so what we got in really within the first year of, of the events of X-Force number one, is we got a story called Executioner Song. Now, in reality, Executioner Song crossed over all the X-Men titles. So X-Men Volume 2, Uncanny X-Men, um, X-Factor, X-Force. I mean, it crossed over all of them. And it was essentially bringing in like these little tidbits of Cable's history. And so what you ended up learning is that at some point in the future, Cable will have a clone. And that clone will not be hindered uh, by a techno-organic virus, which Cable has, that tries to convert his living tissue into machinery. And where Cable has to use his telepathy and telekinesis to keep that virus 
Icarus from quite literally eating him alive, Strife doesn't. And so Strife basically came back in his war against Cable, which had been going on for thousands of years, uh, tried to assassinate Professor X, and done all these horrible deeds while impersonating Cable. And so the idea was that Cable and, uh, and X-Force are deemed too extreme and too dangerous, and were just kind of, you know, scuttled and locked away by the rest of the X-Men universe, and then the, uh, you know, the uh, Executioner's Song crossover continued on, running until X-Force issue number 18. Now, the reason why this matters is because what Fabian Nassiza wanted to do was rework the team in its entirety in his image and not continue Liefeld's work. And so in issue number 18, Cable was killed off. Basically, it was this climactic battle between himself and Strife, and they were just thrown into the time stream. And as far as I'm aware, they were never supposed to be seen or heard from again. And so following that, going into the future of the X-Force comics, while Cable did return in issue number 25, during that interim period, during that seven issues, Nassiza basically crafted the stories in such a way that one, the team immediately broke off from the X-Men, and two, they went to go try to figure out who they were. And this resonated with a whole lot of fans, because what it did is it kind of covered this interim period. And in fact, there's a guy named Brett White who wrote a really, really good article on comic book resources talking about this, uh, which I'll link down in the description. But to basically, because I, I really can't say it better than he did, to kind of reiterate his point, not a lot of comic books focus on like, well, I'll tell you that back. A lot of comic books focus on the interim period, like where you have uh, young kids who gain their power and they're taken under the wing of any particular superhero group. They're taken under the wing of the Avengers in the case of Young Avengers. They're taken under the wing of the X-Men in the case, or I guess under Xavier, in the case of any of the X-Men titles. <laughs> you know, like, like you see that a lot. What you don't see is the interim period when they walk away. And that's what X-Force under Fabian Nassiza basically showed us. It had the new the X-Force essentially saying, our leader is gone, but we're not new mutants anymore. We're not little kids. We're gonna go out and forge our own path. And that's what those seven issues focused on. And so when Cable came back in issue number 25, everything was totally different. And the stories kind of gravitated and pushed themselves in a way where you kind of had this, this line of publications or really like this overarching plot where Cable was trying to be the Xavier of X-Force and they wouldn't accept it. They were like, you can work with us, but you're not. we're not gonna work for you. Like that's that's the way this, this whole thing transpires. There were a lot of other plot threads that went in there in terms of things like, you know, uh, like Hoppycat and Domino and, and what, you know, uh, what Deadpool really was. Deadpool had a lot of appearances in the old, in the early X-Force stories. Uh, but for Fabian Assisa's run, these themes basically concluded with issue number 43 when he walked away from the title in 1995. And so after uh, Fabian Assisa stopped writing, the series was taken over by Jeff Loeb. And really even after Jeff Loeb, it was taken Taken over by by a handful of other people like Warren Ellis. Uh, the, the the whole idea was looking at this whole situation. The goal was to move the stories in a way where they could build on what Fabian Nassiza had done, but each writer could essentially make it their own. And that's the nature of comics. It's kind of the way those things work. The problem with this was that Marvel, by the time Nassiza left uh, in 1995, and then you had Jeff Loeb who took over, and then you had Warren Ellis who took over. Or really, yeah, I'd say Warren Ellis who took over. Um, well, no, you, I think you had you had John Moore who took over before uh, before Warren Ellis did. So Jeff Loeb, John Moore, and then Warren Ellis, I think. Regardless of what order it goes in, the fact remains, you basically ran into a situation where you had Marvel in the midst of the comic bus. And the reason why this matters is because when Marvel was looking at this idea of potentially going bankrupt because you know fans almost destroyed the comic book market, Marvel didn't really have the ability to devote full-time resources to comics that weren't necessarily guaranteed to sell. And while X-Force was initially huge when it first picked up, over the course of Fabian Nassiza's run, where artists like Greg Capullo had like amazing, you know, did like an amazing job on the title, uh, you had guys like Tony Daniel, whose art was, you know, kind of media, you know, moderately received, and then you had a few artists after that, but the sales started to go down. And as the sales started to go down, Marvel started to kind of push in uh, writers who had a name for themselves, like Jeff Loeb, and then start pushing in newer writers and devoting better writers to other publications. It's one of the same reasons why you got Marvel Knights. Like we've talked about that before. Jimmy Palmiotti, Joe Quesada launched Marvel Knights, I'm sorry, launched uh, event publications, basically a way for Marvel to publish stories on superheroes at a cheaper rate uh, for the ones who weren't guaranteed to sell. Daredevil, Punisher, different things like that. The Century, Robert Reynolds, and so on and so forth. And so really running up until about... 
probably about 2001. Uh, for the most part, no, I probably wouldn't even say 2001. Yeah, probably about 2001. For the most part, X-Force just kind of began to consistently drop off. And the whole series was basically canceled and relaunched with issue number 115. Now, the relaunch was really more of like a mini series. And then after that, the whole series was restarted all over again, but it was done under the writing of a guy named Peter Milligan. The problem with Peter Milligan's writing and the problem that a lot of fans had with it was people looked at X-Force and they saw it as like this high octane, super fast paced set of events where you had things popping off all the time. You had guys like GW Bridge and you had Shatterstar and you had all these, these, these just super amped up characters who were impossibly large and different things like that. I mean, Nasiza and Greg Capullo kind of fixed that by drawing them in a more proportioned scale as opposed to Rob Liefeld, who, who basically made Cable like seven feet tall and 500 pounds of just, and like like 0% body fat, <laughs> who made him just like this massive guy. Uh, the fact remains, people didn't really want to see what Peter Milligan had. It was interesting for a little bit, but Peter Milligan really kind of reworked the team into the situation where it was more of like a free floating, uh, kind of, you know, well, you know, figure out your life and enjoy things and you know, whatever happens, happens. And in truth, like, like people weren't really on board with that. Now, the reason why that worked for what it was, or at least the reason why Marvel went with that, is because in 2001, following the departure, or I would really even say in 2004, but in 2001, following the departure of Grant Morrison, Marvel had something called X-Men Reload. And X-Men Reload was basically looking at the entire landscape of the X-Men comics, and then just relaunching them. That was the whole idea. We've talked about that before, right? Like, you know, Joe Quesada came in as editor-in-chief and said, okay, what you guys have been doing for the last 10 years is what almost made you bankrupt. So we're going to fix this. And so he went through and literally just started cutting a swath through everything. Peter Parker lost the marriage to Mary Jane. 98% of the mutant population lost their powers. The Avengers broke up. I mean, it was, it was a massive undertaking in terms of like trying to make it all work. And, and, and it was fine. I mean, honestly, I liked a lot of what came out of it, but the fact remains here that under Peter Milligan's writing, the team just didn't really resonate with fans. And a lot of that was because when Joe Quesada sat down and said, what are we going to reinvigorate? What are we not going to reinvigorate? X-Force was on the back burner because it hadn't really been popular since Fabian Nassiza left. And so following this, what Marvel did is in, in light of the X-Men reload, the goal was to rework the entirety of the X-Men mythos. And so for the most part, X-Force kind of took a back burner for like six years. It was gone for a long time. You had a mini series in there somewhere, but basically it was gone. And so this segued into the post House of M landscape going into Messiah Complex and Messiah War with Craig Kyle and Chris Yoss Run, which I really kind of consider to be uh, X-Force Volume 3 although some people call it X-Force Volume 2, taking into account the mini series. But in terms of the ongoing X-Force series, it's Volume 2. But the idea of Craig Kyle and Chris Yoss, it was amazing because what their X-Force team did is it really, for the first time, broke the team away from Cable and said, this is a standalone X-Men team. And so what it did is, I'm sorry, yeah, what it did is it basically uh, maintained the charter of the original X-Force and being like a Black Ops strike force, but it did it without Cable. And so what had happened here is following the events of House of M, you went into a story called Messiah Complex and then a story called Messiah War. And Messiah Complex was basically the birth of the first mutant after 98% of the mutant population lost their powers. And it was a mad dash for this for this new mutant who was born. You ended up finding out that Cable was tasked with getting the mutant out of there, uh, and the, the request was made by Charles Xavier, but because of the fact that this mutant was born after the events of House of M, you had various groups out there who wanted to destroy it because they believed that it was the harbinger of like the resurgence of mutant population. You had groups out there who wanted to kidnap it and use it for experimentation, find a way to duplicate its powers, create more mutant powers. And then you had the X-Men who wanted to capture it so they could keep it safe because they believed that like it was going to be the, the second rise of, of the mutant population and things were going to return to the way they were before Scarlet Witch screwed everything up. And so coming out of that, when it was learned by Cyclops, that Cable had kidnapped the, I'm sorry, the Cable had taken the baby and basically was jumping through the time stream, he reformed X-Force using uh, Wolverine, X-23, not Psylocke, I don't think she came until Rick Remender's run, but maybe she did. Anyway, they, they basically reworked the team and the idea with, for the first really, I think it was about 28 issues that it ran. The idea was you guys are going to, your your initial launch of the team is going to be to jump into the future and find Cable, get the baby and bring it back, which they successfully did. Following that, because the return of X-Force was so popular and because the story was so well written, Marvel continued it on as long as they could. The issue with this is that they did this in the midst of reworking the X-Men constantly. And so it was only ever going to be a short-lived series because things change all the time. And so what ended up happening is that an issue, uh, issue 
issue number 28, uh, by the time that issue came along, the X-Force brand had kind of been expanded on, you know, from its original intention with regards to the launch of Volume 3, and it turned into be a Black Ops team, be a Strike Force team, and serve the purpose of making sure that one, nobody knows you exist, and two, going through and doing whatever you need to do in order to make sure that like no other members of the mutant population are harmed. And again, like a team led by Wolverine was massively popular, but following this and going into the launch of uh, really 2010 and the start of Marvel Now, that was a conclusion of Joe Quesada's whole 10 year, you know, decade long work to reinvigorate Marvel. And so where you had a lot of stories that went in between, where you had things like Fear Itself, where everybody gets a hammer of Thor and you had like all these crazy situations that went on, what you ended up getting was something called the heroic age and the heroic age was essentially sitting down and saying okay so we had civil war where captain america and iron man fought over superhuman registration the bad guys won registration went through that led to the revelation of secret invasion where the shape-shifting scroll race had replaced all you know a huge chunk of the superhero community if not all of it and a pretty good chunk of humanity that led into the events of uh, of dark rain where after civil war iron man was director of shield but didn't know secret invasion had happened and so they booted him out saying he was inept Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin, became director of S.H.I.E.L.D., disbanded it, tried to conquer the world, and that led to the, to the defeat of Norman Osborn following Dark Reign. And so the, the heroic age was kind of Marvel saying, now we're getting back to the age of heroes as you know them. And so it was like, well, we've just rediscovered what it means to be Avengers and so on and so forth and different things like that. And for the, for the X-Force team, under Rick Remender, it was kind of reworking it and making things work again. But X-Force was rooted and based in a darker team. And so because of that, while everything else was everybody rediscovering their roles as heroes the idea of rick remender was make you know keep them dark keep them toned down and so in the first story arc they basically assassinate uh the the character that will become apocalypse like phantom x a member of x-force just shoots him and that's it uh the stories kind of remained in that path and they stayed relatively dark when you go after that when you went after rick remender's run it kind of broke off into a couple of different titles you had cable and x-force and then uncanny x-force which was the name of the rick remender run uncanny x-force uh and and it served its purpose for what it was. The problem is that by this point in time, the population or popularity in the X-Men in terms of Marvel Comics it was kind of running stagnant, and it actually has for quite some time. In all new, all different Marvel, it dropped off almost in its entirety because a lot of people didn't like the direction that Marvel was going in because they were kind of like scuttling back the, the X-Men and trying to replace them with the Inhumans, which no one liked it because no one cares about the Inhumans because the Inhumans don't even care about the Inhumans. And so because of that, like, like, what you ended up having was an X-Force team that was reminiscent of the 1990s in terms of themes, but none of the stories were compelling. As interesting as they were, Dennis Hopeless, Sam Humphreys, who were writing, you know, uh, Cable, Cable in the X, I'm sorry, Cable and X-Force and Uncanny X-Force respectively, uh, it was a story, it was a line of comics that existed, but it just didn't really work. And Marvel had tried to rework the things on several occasions. For example, after Peter Milligan's run, it was revamped and turned into um, Ecstatics, which was kind of weird. It was basically like a reality TV show version of X-Force. Marvel had tried to rework the team over the years and make it more interesting in an effort to try to kind of capture the Fabian Nassiza run. But the reality of the situation is that the 1990s X-Force team was lightning in a bottle. And from what I see with Deadpool 2, it's basically going to be Fabian Nassiza's X-Force. That's really what it looks like it's going to be. The roster may have changed a little bit, uh, but that's basically what it's going to be. It's, it's essentially going to be that version of the team, which is good because that's the one that people are most well, well aware of. I mean, in truth, I'd say the X-Force team that you see in Deadpool 2 is going to be a combination of the late end of, of um, yeah, of Rob Liefeld's New Mutants going into like the early launch of X-Force, kind of that in-between period right there. It's basically the version of the team that you're going to see, which in reality is still kind of the same team. It doesn't really change. Uh, but still, I mean, it, it looks like it'll be awesome. I mean, that's that's kind of what I'm hoping for here is it'll give us a, it'll, it'll at least for me anyway, sitting down and, and looking at Deadpool 2, it'll remind me of the early 90s and, and really like the mid 90s um, uh, X-Force run, but at the same time, also, also something, you know, offer something a little bit refreshing and, and kind of give us a new take. But nonetheless, hopefully this helped you guys out to, to understand the nature of X-Force and, and why it exists and the purpose it serves. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah. I will catch you all later. Peace.